Once, people were afraid of thunderstorms. Later, they came to fear witchcraft, the end of the world, world war, and aliens. Nowadays, though, people are freaked out by carrots, tomatoes, and apples. The term GMO, or genetically modified organisms, cover more than just vegetables and fruit. Scientists, medical researchers, and biotechnologists have been modifying the genes of bacteria, animals, and even humans for a long time now. But the debate on GMO almost always centers around what we eat. Is this really the high road to a future without famine? Or does GMO have a flip side? This is to be debated. You're probably aware that every cell in your body has a nucleus, inside which are found your DNA molecules, long, twisted, double-stranded spirals of nucleotides, the letters of the genetic alphabet. Only four letters are used, but the whole word, your genome, comprises three billion letters, almost like the name of some villages in Wales. Some parts of this word determine which protein the cell will produce. These parts are called genes. Same with plants. There's an old joke about the banana and human genome being 50% identical. And the funniest thing is, that's not a joke at all. A genetically modified organism is any organism that has a gene from another organism. This is what usually worries people. What if we transplanted frog genes into a pineapple? It's quite possible from a practical point of view. Obviously, it won't start jumping around and croaking, but it's all the more suspicious for that. What might we expect from it? What if the frog gene jumps into me when I eat? In reality, our nuclear DNA is a very old and very reliable molecule. It stores the hereditary information as carefully and securely for bacteria, plants, and animal, as it does for us. And if a tomato's genes could so easily jump into its consumers, we would be living in a completely different world with neither us nor tomatoes in it, inhabited by nothing but infinite accidental combination of genes. Does this mean that we can only exchange genes with each other? Well, not really. For example, viruses can make their way into our DNA. That doesn't always mean getting the disease. Gene therapy is built on this. Medical researchers make viruses not to break up in the right order of letters in the word, which is the reason behind many complicated illnesses, including cancer, but rather to correct the mistakes instead. And if we're okay with cancer gene therapy, then why are we scared of the same sort of therapy is given to a vegetable? It's not just medical researchers and scientists that can do this. Meet an agrobacterium. 8,000 years ago, she incorporated her genes into a sweet potato, which is now consumed all over the world from South America to Oceania. Humans are not yet familiar with iron working, and the potter's will were eating GMO and survived. Yet it's hard to imagine that the bacteria was creating these natural GMOs with more accuracy than contemporary scientists do given that she had neither a brain, nor education, nor scientific ambition. Genetic modification doesn't differ at all from ordinary selective breeding, just without decades spent on selecting the sweetest and juiciest of wild pears, and then picking the best from the next generation over and over again, so that the genes you need really take hold in the breed. Instead, you make all necessary changes right away and only need time for numerous tests and certification. But it's not really about making our lives sweeter and juicier. In as little as 30 years, there is likely to be nine billion of us. And there's little chance that at least some will have to quit eating because of the fear of GMO. Genetic methods increase the efficiency of agriculture, for instance, by making the seed more resistant to drought and pests, food, thus becomes much more affordable, but it can become healthier too. The most famous example is that of golden rice. Gene engineers have enriched it with a striking amount of beta carotene. Our body converts this into vitamin A, a lack of which causes dermatitis, ulcers, and most terribly, irreversible blindness. 
That's half a million cases per year. Golden rice can halt this without doctors and pills. Finally, let's have a look in the fridge. Inside it, missed the fruits and vegetables, we have piled up all the studies that prove harm caused by genetically modified food. But let's be honest, there is none. We promise, if we do come up, we'll put them in a video description. Sure, Googling will help you find a lot of GMO opponents. But scientific research is not just scientific opinion. It has to be abide by rules and conditions, statistical methods, undergo testing by the academic community, and be published in an academic journal. Not in a fear of broccoli.org blog. Let's save time. Most well-known research on the risk of GM food has been scientifically debunked, which is also easy to Google. Yes, they're still being read and quoted, but spreading fake stories is also easier than making a nerdy inquiry into where and how the author is lying. But is the genetically modified future really so glittering and bright? New technologies are often intrinsically awesome. The problem lies in how we use them. Man has tamed the atom, but now we've got nuclear weapons. So now we have technologies that help detect potential terrorists. But this has resulted in total surveillance deprives us of privacy. Same with GMO. A major problem here is large corporate monopolies. Yes, different nations have different policies. Nearly 30 countries only allow genetically modified plants to be imported, banning their cultivation. Several other countries forbid both. But regardless of state borders, almost all the world markets is divided between a bunch of large corporations. The biggest are Monsanto, the Point Pioneer and Syngenta, the joint gods of genetic modification. You've brought their magical seeds and harvested the crops, but you can't plant them again next spring. You have to buy again. The firms regard the seeds as their intellectual property. Just like you can't resell the music bought on iTunes or from any other online store. And believe me, the copyright owners will sue you for infringement, even if their property was only bought into your land by the wind. This is unsurprising, given the corporations invest billions of dollars in developing GM seeds. But you think they've been working for years on improving the cucumber taste or inventing the perfect seedless watermelon, you're mistaken. At best, they are concerned how to make tomatoes soften as late as possible, better in your fridge than in the store or on the road. But most often, they care about quite different things entirely. In 1970, Monsanto patented glyphosate, the perfect weed-killing herbicide. And in 1996, they patented plant varieties genetically programmed to be resistant to it, a dream come true. You water the field, everything unwanted withers away, and everything wanted grows and bloom. Just don't forget to pay the same company for both the herbicide and the seed. A year earlier, Monsanto taught potatoes to release toxins, safe for people, but deadly for pets. And now they earn $9 billion per year from these genetically modified seeds. Today, 90% of corn and cotton and 94% of soy in the US are herbicide resistant GMOs. Not always to glyphosate. Each market giant invents its own herbicides and their own breeds, making money from both. And behind it, there's another hidden danger, monocultures. And so everyone everywhere starts cultivating the same breeds since it's convenient and cheap. The problem is not a direct consequence of GMO technologies, but it does, to be honest, go hand in hand with them. When the same thing is grown everywhere, biodiversity is hit hard. Those weeds and pests that are harmless for GM crops spread out and start to terrorize the neighborhood. But the main problem is deeper. The more similar plants are, the less resistance they are to new, as yet unknown diseases and pests. And more likely it is that hunger will continue. It might seem unimaginable now, but just 1.5 centuries ago, before any kind of GMO, the Phloxera, a small insect from North America, 
killed off two-thirds of European vineyards. In 2009, a cotton moth was found in India which was immune to these plant toxins. Luckily, it was detected in time and the next generations of seeds were reprogrammed. Sure, reprogramming the seeds still sounds like rocket science, although we've discovered that genetic modification merely involves changing the order of the nucleotides in the genome. It's not enough to get the new world order in the lab or to see it in your dreams. Even for the industry giant to take years to bring a new strain into the market. But they can afford it and we can't. And as long as this is the case, their business is not under threat. It turns out that both vocal GMO opponents and those who consider them nut jobs are equally mistaken in their own way. This debate is very important. But what we need to discuss is not our likelihood of turning into frogs, but rather the economic and environmental consequences. Indeed, healthy monopolism is a phenomenon as rare as caviar-flavoured, genetically modified aubergines. What's next to be debated? Subscribe to the channel and never miss our new videos. And you can support us on Patreon. It's so much appreciated.